My name is Rudy Hanfield. I'm a government analyst, and frankly, I'm blown away. When I was on travel to one of our embassies abroad, I got detained by a foreign government for three days. It felt like an inquisition. They asked me about my work, what I was doing there, where I lived. But the scary thing is how much they already knew. Personal information, things about me and my family. I never considered what I do very important. I mean, it's far from mission critical, you know? I didn't think they'd pay any attention to me. How? And why me? Why target me? My dad always told us not to talk about what he does or where he goes. And I've been careful. Very careful. The only ones who know anything about it are my cousins. I kept them updated on Facebook, made sure to use the privacy controls so they were the only ones who could see it. What else can you do? Our operations in that region failed. It's no good to us now. The work of dozens of individuals. Three years of hard work snuffed out because too much information was leaked in the damn web. It wasn't just the hand feel screw up. Yeah, that was a mess. The adversary probably had months, maybe in years of emails and web posts made by people and organizations tied to the mission, all in the name of sharing information. And now, well, now we're closed down in that region all down the tubes from a few strokes of the keyboard. Thank God nobody got hurt. No casualties. Nobody died this time. Sup, my name is Bruce Holmes. My business card doesn't say hacker, but I can get into your internet business in a heartbeat if I wanted to. I can get info on who you are, who you're connected to, your passwords, bank account info, credit card numbers, and more than you probably want to know about. I can just about undo your entire life or even assume it in less time than it takes to watch Gone with the Wind. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. It really isn't that hard. All somebody needs is a little training and some cheapo tools that you can find right on the web. And you're a hacker in training. Just about anyone can use your technology against you if they're motivated, mischievous, and feel like they can get something out of it. Sometimes motivation comes just because somebody has a little time on their hands or an ax to grind. And any target is a good one. When you throw yourself into the cyber world, you're exposed to bad guys who don't care who they hit. Recreational hackers, identity thieves, industrial spies, or private organizations. And they don't discriminate. You may be the dullest peeps on the planet, but you're walking on the cyber battlefield and your goods are up for grabs. So what do you do about it? It's not like we live in a world today where you can just pretend the internet doesn't exist. It's here to stay, babe. Well, trust me. There are ways to protect yourself, and you don't need to be Bill Gates to do it. There's technology to help, but the key is using your noggin to answer that new age-old riddle, to post or not to post. That is the question. This is a good thought for what leaves your yap as well. Uh huh. You also need to get better at figuring out where the threats lie and wait, just watching for you to screw up. But back to my earlier point. Not every thought and experience you have needs to be published on the cyber self-expression blogosphere, okay? Can we at least agree on that? Marjorie, you know I'm talking to you, girl. Keep those spring break pictures offline. They're way too naughty. <laughs> anyway, that's the kind of stuff this briefing is all about. Making sure you don't end up like Susie Q, who blew her dad's mission. Or like Dr. Dad, PhD, who got to see what the cyber adversary looks like face to face. And ensuring that you don't have to play the cards somebody else dealt. 
like the commander who had nothing to do with the mistakes that were made, but still has to pay the price. I'm going to show you how to keep yourself safe in the cyber world. Sometimes through security, sometimes through obscurity, and sometimes by just keeping your fingers off the keyboard and mouse. So, if you want to keep yourself and your gear out of the clutches of bad guys, you're going to need to understand how it all works. Okay kids, it's time for Internet 101. And it's really quite simple. I'm here and you're there and there are about 7 billion people between you and me who can steal every email, text, IM, call or any other transmission you can think of. After all, it is the World Wide Web. Hello world! Okay, so not every one of those 7 billion people are trying to hijack your cyber stuff. How many hackers are there, you ask? You tell me. But I can tell you how many it takes to ruin your life. One. But more on that later. These little thingies, they connect us to one another in cyberspace. Uh, here's your router, maybe a wireless hub, connected to your modem, onto your provider's server. And off we go, bouncing from server to server all over the planet till you reach the web page or person you want to connect to. Am I losing you? Well, let's turn it over to a real expert on the internet. No, not Al Gore. Him. There are four primary components to sending data on the internet. Packets, infrastructure, routers, and terminals. The first components, packets, are nothing more than a carrier that the system is designed to transport. Inside are data and a destination address. The data can be anything. Movies, music, pictures, instant messages, voice, anything. If you can store it on a computer, you can stuff it in a packet and send it along. To get packets from place to place, you need the second primary component, infrastructure. Wires, satellites, radio towers, and more. But we'll just say wires to keep it simple. From city to city and country to country, there are literally millions of miles of wires connecting everything in a vast web spanning the entire world. The infrastructure's only job is to transport packets from one end of a wire to the other. Making sure packets can make it through this mess is the router's job. Routers sit at the endpoints where the wires come together. When a packet comes in, the router first checks the addressing information inside. Then it selects the next path to send the packet down based on which one it thinks will get it to its destination the fastest. Kind of like those thingamabobbers, which determine which track a train goes down. Got it? Finally, the packet shows up at its endpoint, which is usually a computer. It's at this point a user can see and interact with the information that was sent and respond, which uses the same approach, but in reverse. With these four simple components, Packets, wires, routers, and your computer, the magic of the web is accomplished. So what's missing? Security. Awesome. Not that kind of security. The internet wasn't designed to be secure. It was designed to be efficient. But that's a matter for my main man, Bruce, to cover. Word up, Bruce! So remember this simple principle. There is nothing on the internet that is secure until someone takes the trouble to make it so. Never assume that what you're doing is safe until you find out for sure from someone who knows. <laughs> How was that, buddy? Was I cool enough? Ah, uh, he used to help me in math class back in the day. Well, now that you know all there is to know about the plumbing, Let's talk about what lurks in the cyber neighborhood. I'm gonna give you a sneak peek at the kind of information the bad guy was sniffing from our analyst, little Susie Q. Here's how it went down. 
So, Susie Q gets news from Dad, our civilian analyst, that the base is sending him to a region where it's hot and sandy. Suze decides it's easier to post the news about Dad on Facebook than to call the six cousins she keeps up with. Susie's right. Our girlie did select good security controls for her Facebook account on the photos, but she made the assumption that this applied to the rest of her profile. Wrong. She shared her most intimate thoughts with every goon on the planet. And when news about Dad's wild adventure got posted, an unwanted web surfer or two got interested, very interested. And the social media tools of the day made gathering intel as easy as taking candy from a baby. It wasn't hard to figure out the city and state she lives in just from perusing the network she belongs to. Once that was established, a little cross-reference with military bases in that part of the country, hit the base's website and do a quick search for Susie's last name and voila! Seconds later, we find the good Dr. Hanfield right there on the personnel page. There, we learn that his education as a Farsi linguist has helped the armed forces to better understand the culture of the Middle East. Google, Hanfield, Rudy, Doctor, well I'll be. Look at the articles published by Rudy Hanfield, PhD. Nice work, Doc. And an old resume floating around at jobboard.com. I feel like we've known one another for years. A simple whitepages.com search gives us his home address and home phone number. MapQuest gives me driving directions from the airport to his humble abode if I need him. And I get a preview through Street View that lets me walk down his home street and take a virtual gander at his neighborhood and his house. Ha! Okay, so after some online searching, we find a church bulletin that lists his religious affiliation and, more importantly, his cell phone number. A little later, we find the Federal Election Commission's website lists Rudy's contributions to his favorite political party. It's just like that. Let's say in less than 30 minutes, and without using any hacking tricks at all, this guy's info painted a pretty decent picture of who he is, where he's been, and where he's going. From there, it's not too big a stretch to continue surfing around, make a few phone calls, and wrap it all up with a little old-fashioned snooping around and a pretty blue ribbon. All of a sudden, Dr. Hanfield's life is in my hands. Oh yeah, and because I played the bonus round, so was his family's. And just for giggles, why not take down a government project on the way? Time for a word from our sponsors. You may have been fooled into thinking this briefing was about cybersecurity, but that's only part of the deal. You've actually reached the OPSEC zone. A story how we can protect our information simply by amping up our awareness and exercising the gray matter that resides within our cerebral cortex. Brick and mortar stuff. You see, people are so busy thinking about what anti-spy virus clean me up and protect me forever software to use that they just stop using their brain. OPSEC first is your best anti-hacker protection. Take it in, my friends. Back here in a few. So OPSEC is a process used to identify and deny critical information. You know, specific info about capabilities, intentions, and the like. Keeping it locked off from bad guys who want to use your stuff to their advantage, or at the very least, to your disadvantage. It's a process that can be applied in real time. You just need the right mindset. Classified is easy. There are rules and laws to protect this kind of data. What's hard is realizing how important the protection of unclassified data can be. Things like network diagrams, names, and job titles of the people you work with, and even something as simple as daily schedules or itineraries. All of these can make the bad guy's job easier. Be sure to analyze the threat. Asking the right questions can be very valuable. Who wants your information? Who could benefit from your critical data? Some obvious answers would be competitors, enemy organizations, and even the media. All of them want to know what you know. But there's also the risk of random enemies. What about that curious 16-year-old who tricks someone into installing a cool game that was actually a secret door that could be used to get into your system? 
Maybe he just looks around in there. Maybe he posts what he finds online exposing your data to the world. Or maybe he even plants something illegal or embarrassing on your systems just for laughs. Here's what you need to think about. As you determine your security strategy, you'll need to determine what vulnerabilities are present. This may well be your highest call. Social vulnerabilities, like someone tricking an executive secretary into giving up his or her boss's schedule, still happen every day. But adversaries and opponents are switching to more sophisticated and technical means to leverage vulnerabilities. The need to trick a secretary doesn't exist if a bad guy can remotely peek at his Outlook calendar or hack into his Blackberry. Heightened awareness needs to be observed and vulnerabilities identified when you use technology solutions. Understanding risks that may be present will help in establishing measures necessary to fight against it. Information owners must be constantly asking what consequences will arise if that information is compromised. The risk assessment step is where decisions are made that will help estimate potential liability and be a guide in establishing a cost-benefit analysis. This data will be valuable as you consider potential corrective actions. The development and implementation of countermeasures will round out plans to protect information. When risk reaches a level that's too high to work around, countermeasures need to be put into place to reduce the level to an acceptable standard. Not all countermeasures are expensive. You may find that some are inexpensive, making their application a wise move even when the risk is low. And don't get too caught up in technical solutions. A countermeasure is anything that works, anything that will make it harder for adversaries to get your critical information. All right, back to it. So we're talking about cyberspace, which includes not only the internet, but all of the places the internet touches, like cell phones, laptops, and those ever so convenient USB drives that you carry around with you. Yep, that's right. They're all part of the cyber world. So when you work and play in cyberspace, your information is at risk of being nabbed or compromised by everyone else that has a browser, a phone, a wireless access point, blah, 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 blah. Maybe you find that scary and you should, but get your head out of the sand. There are things you can do to protect yourself. A little more on the tricks and traps you'll find out there than on to how to wear the cyber armor. You can't wait? Oh. That's music to my ears. And speaking of music. Hey there, cats and kittens. Settle back and enjoy a sample of the tunes brought to you by defenseless computers everywhere. These groovy tunes will remind you that you leave your mark wherever you go out there in that big bad world wide web. And that cyber world can be filled with candy, cookies, and cockroaches. So open wide and say, ah, yeah. part of the hacker hits from the 50s. It's cookie cookie. Won't you remember me? The web browser cookie. We trust them. We use them to store info about us. They make us memorable as we revisit our old web haunts. Listen, be careful. They can do you harm and leak information about you. Cookies store some of our most critical information, such as usernames, passwords, email info, and credit card numbers. If a bad guy gets a hold of your cookies, he can see the sites you visit, steal your identity, and even get into sites using your digits. No need to fret though, you can take control. Set your browser to block cookies, then whitelist only the ones you want to allow, and never ever, 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 ever choose the option to remember a password for locations that are important, like your email and online shopping sites. While we're on the topic, can I ask you confidentially, are you a one password lover? Be careful, this has all the makings of a bad country song. Yeehaw! Such dedication! You've got one love and you're sticking to it. You're a one password surfer, and that's just your way of saying, well, take me as I am. They're gonna take you all right. Well, think about it like this. If the one password fits all method makes things easy for you, it's gonna make hacking your box a piece of cake. When you sign up for a web service, all the people that work there can see your name and maybe your password too. Even if they're okay, maybe someone hacks in and suddenly, 
They've got your name and password, Mrs. Redskins123. What happens if they try to log into other major web services you subscribe to? Bingo. You'll be crying boo-hoo country blues. Use strong and unique passwords for all your accounts. And make them like a snowflake. No two the same. Here's one that's near and dear to my heart. It's every search you make, I'll be watching you. A search engine is a beautiful thing. Oh, Google, you broaden me. You make the whole web my oyster. Who knew that you were two-timing me all along? <sighs> it's sad, but true. Search engines store all your search data, sometimes for years. Be careful about doing too many searches with the same search engine. Again, too much data makes you very predictable. Can I get a hat? <sighs> and if you use mapping tools online, you don't always need to search for an address. Try using a zip code instead. It's close enough that you'll be able to get there without taking a web snooper right to the resident or company's front door. And get this, if you're logged into your mail and then you use the same search service like Yahoo Mail or Yahoo Search capability, then they can tie your searches directly to your profile. Just log out before searching. Ain't it nice to be known? <clears throat> and who can forget this old favorite? You're not who I thought you were. Watch out for imposters, mon ami. They'll steal your heart every time. Uh, the mission of an imposter site is to lead you off track, way off track. They look downright bona fide, like the real deal, and the URL might only be off by a letter or two. But trust me, Nothing good will come once you hit the load button. Just no telling who or what's behind the fake storefront. Imposter sites generally mirror legitimate destinations and use common URL misspellings to get you there. And once you're in, they play on your confusion and get you to put in a username, a password, a credit card number, maybe worse. You, thinking it's the site that you've grown to love and trust, will usually comply. And then, you're all theirs. Now. If you make a habit of typing all your web addresses in a search engine, instead, the search will lead to your legitimate site, even if you're a lousy speller. As a matter of fact, some search engines and antivirus programs even have anti-imposter protections built right in. But they only work when you're searching, not when you type the name directly into the URL field. Sound like a hassle? Compare that to the hassle of a compromised account. Uh-huh, that's what I'm talking about. Want to protect yourself even more? Sure you do. Turn off scripting, flash, and other advanced browsing features. They make the web fun, but they also make it dangerous. And don't blindly follow links sent in emails or one that are randomly posted to your MySpace and Facebook profiles. Okay, last ditty, I promise. How about a little ballad that sings of the folly of fake alerts? Every web user should be on the lookout for fake alerts. They look like legitimate warnings or system messages, but they're far from it. Sometimes they're easy to spot because they totally appear in a browser window, but we want to believe them so badly. We take the bait because they look shiny and legit, like they really want to help us. The phony fake can't harm you if you don't click on it, so just turn away. Just turn away. Are you still looking? I said turn away, dude. Okay, I know it's hard. If you're not sure if the alert is fake, just close all your browser windows from the taskbar. If the alert goes away, you're safe. If the alert is still there, the alert is real, but the instructions might not be. The bad alerts always name a website or tool to check out, but go and research it first from a search engine. If the first 20 links all give you advice on how to get rid of the tool or warn you not to touch it, take the hint. Just close the alert and go about your business. Listen, there are enough sad cyber songs to fill a box set. Folk tales about ActiveX and Java. Access blues tunes about 
one-password Wanda, fishing foibles about sad suckered Sammy. I know them all by heart. There just ain't enough time in the day to teach them all to you, so you're going to have to research them on your own. These problems all begin when we think we're invincible. Know where the vulnerabilities are and take measures to shut them down immediately. And that's the name of that tune. Think that old jukebox is all there is in the big bag of bad guy tricks? There are plenty more ways to get burned in cyberspace. Emails, chat rooms, IM, forums, blogs and wikis and VoIP, oh my. And oh yeah, they all have the same vulnerabilities. Sketchy security and plenty of room for human error. Not the least of which is, there's no way to tell who you're really talking to. Frankly, this is a real problem. When you're online, how do you really know who you're speaking with? Think of people with net friends, people that have developed a friendship or some sort of a relationship online, but they've never actually met in person. Maybe that person's who they say they are, maybe not. In the security business, we call the tactic of leveraging a relationship social engineering. If I'm a bad guy, I might take on a fake online persona for all kinds of reasons. Maybe I need some specific information I can get you to divulge or some task performed, like software installed, or a web link clicked if I pretend to be your company's IT guy. Maybe I want you to call a certain phone number or download some tool or attachment. Whatever it is, it's some action that I can exploit to gain more access if you're dumb enough to act without validating the credentials of the individual you're dealing with. What did P.T. Barnum say? As a sucker born every minute? People fall for this online ID thing all the time. What can I say? It looked like a real email. I mean, it said it was from my bank. I even checked the from field and the reply field to be sure. It, it all checked out. Don't the banks have something to prevent people from faking emails in their name? I got this email, okay? It said my friends posted a picture of me and to click on the link to see it. When I clicked the link, the page came up. It looked just like the real site. So yeah, I logged in. Next thing I know, my password stolen. My entire address book totally spammed. I'm not only embarrassed, but I have a lot of friends who are pretty ticked. Now they're getting infected emails from what looks like my email address. The bad guys aren't stupid. They know if an email doesn't look legit, you won't buy it. So they mimic a known sender. Amazon, eBay, your bank, your company CEO. They have to make it as real as possible so they can trick you into responding. And as a general rule, you should always be suspicious of administrative or security emails, financial emails, or messages that have attachments, especially when they're not signed or if you weren't expecting the message. Look, it takes like 10 seconds to verify an email before you open it. Pick up the phone and call or email the sender at a known email address to make sure they sent it before acting. When you send an email with an attachment, you can make it easy for the person on the other end to validate the attachment's authenticity. Yeah, digital signatures work, but they are not foolproof. Include a bit of text that lets them know it's really you. Something simple like, great to see you last Thursday. Anything that proves you are who you say you are. Stuff that a bad guy wouldn't know. Let's assume you do know who you're communicating with online. Problem solved, right? Well, not exactly. Even if you can, without a doubt, identify who you're communicating with, the internet still isn't secure. Let me say it again. The internet is not secure. No matter how you communicate online, by default it's not encrypted, and prying eyes will be able to see. Do you email your work home? Of course. I email my work to my personal account all the time. It lets me leave the office a few minutes early, beat rush hour, get in some personal time with my family and get back to it. Everybody does it. What's the big deal? Nine. Nine. My hypothesis proves that there is nothing to prevent someone from intercepting data during transmission. Or this can be done through a tapping the communication line, or more simply, by controlling the router passing the information between servers. Routers are designed to open data packets just far enough to read the addressing information. But, Atum, 
there is nothing to stop them from going further. And intercepted data can be snooped, manipulated without the sender or recipient having a clue. And who knows what else? Very clear now, yeah? So there's good news, okay? There are plenty of things people have come up with to add security to online communications. The first step is to get set up with the right tools. But the second, and maybe the most important step, is to actually use them. How's that for a concept? You might need specialized software or hardware for important work functions. But even the most basic computer can resist threats with a few commercially available tools. There's a boatload of freebies out there, and I gotta say, some are pretty good. Every major browser and website has basic encryption features for activities like logging in or secure shopping, but it's a user's job to look for signs from the browser. They need to be sure they can see the lock icon, or an S, that stands for secure at the end of the HTTP in their URL bar. This tells them that the web traffic is encrypted. It's not a silver bullet. There's no single solution that provides absolute security, but it's a start. Data can still be lost, mishandled, you name it. Protect the line between you and the sites you visit. Make sure your login details and data aren't out there for everyone to see. It's especially important when you first log in and when you're shopping from hotspots in hotels and airports and coffee shops. And don't even get me started on internet security abroad. Patty ho ah, you're off duty. It's time to relax, surf the web, check out a few blogs, update a wiki, post some photos of the kiddos on Facebook, comment in a forum or two, tweet a few lines. Some of it is uninhibited, but that's the point. After all, only your friends will see it. Why would anyone else even care? <laughs> yeah, bet that's what these people thought. The undisclosed location of a U.S. military base is secret no more, thanks to these photos posted on Flickr by some of the service members stationed there. Security experts say equipment and other identifiers in the shot's background, along with GPS tags added by the digital camera that took the shots, has allowed the location of the facility to be identified. One area businessman embarrassed himself this week when the leak of important financial and strategic information about his company was traced back to his own Facebook account. It started when he accepted the friend request of someone claiming to be an acquaintance from business school, and the two began corresponding. It turns out the profile was an elaborate hoax constructed from public records by a creative competitor. This just in, the Marine Corps has ordered social media sites, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, and others banned from its networks effective immediately. The order cited a high risk of information leakage and stated that the banned sites are, quote, a proven haven for malicious actors and content. They present a particularly high risk due to information exposure, unvetted user-generated content, and targeting by U.S. adversaries, end quote. Getting the picture? It's not just your college buddies checking out your online profile. You might be alone when you post it, but the whole wicked world is on the other end of your mouse, just waiting to use your benign data stream to slam you. So, let's say you screw up. You posted something, now you're having second thoughts. Try to pull it down, but act quickly. The window is short. Search bots and web crawlers constantly search the web for new content. And the rule of thumb is that once it's out there, it's out there for good. And the best part? Posting dumb stuff doesn't require a bad guy to screw up your life. You can do that all on your own. <sighs> Let's join the next program already in session. Medic. Thank you, Stoney. We're here today with IT expert Raymond Smythe discussing the new cyber threat. So, Mr. Smythe, we're becoming a portable world, able to access information from wherever we are, whenever we want. What sort of security concerns come along with that convenience? Well, there are a whole slew of concerns as we rely more and more on wireless technology and portable devices, especially to keep us connected to one another. 
Wireless networks, cell phones, portable technology, and even Bluetooth and RFID create security risks that we didn't have to worry about a decade ago. Okay, so let's talk about wireless. It's everywhere. What are the concerns? Wireless networks aren't making the world of computer security easier, that's for sure. Uh, the signal on a wireless router goes in all directions, so anyone with a little knowledge on how these things work can intercept the signal. Uh, you don't have to be a world-class hacker either. You just need to be within range, which in some cases can be over a mile away. I'd say in light of this, it's critical that anyone setting up a wireless network have a thorough understanding of network security. If not, it's probably best to leave wireless out of their network architecture. That sounds like a good idea. What other technologies present cyber challenges? Uh, definitely portable devices. They're small, convenient to carry, and most use weak or no security at all. Uh, when I say portable, I'm talking about things like PDAs, wireless keyboards, mice, watches that record, uh, MP3 players, thumb drives, uh, even laptops. Gosh, I'm, I'd be willing to bet we use those every day, every one of us. So let's talk about the most popular, the cell phone. Everyone's got one, they've got cameras, they have GPS capability. What's the state of the union on devices like that? Uh, well, cell phones are especially relevant here. Even when a phone is protected from a wireless intrusion, they can provide harmful data to prying ears and eyes. These days, if somebody can physically get a hold of your phone, hack in or trick you into installing their bad code, it's like they've stolen a four-ounce treasure chest that holds all your precious jewels. There's information on you, your friends, your activities. It gets really creepy. They can even turn on the phone's camera or microphone remotely. Smile and say cheese for the cyber stalker. That is really creepy. So what does the future hold with so many of these devices in circulation? Well, more of the same, just in greater volume. Uh, mobile devices are easy to use, easy to carry, and easy to lose. Nobody's going to physically steal a rack of servers, but they can lift a phone or a USB device in half a second. In fact, tons of organizations report data breaches as a result of employees losing thumb drives and laptops that turn up in the wrong hands all the time. Uh, the IRS reported that they lost 490 laptops over a three-year period. wonder what's on them that's going to come back to bite you and me. Yeah, that's a lot of laptops that are lost. So that is definitely something to worry about. What about tracking? I've seen bad guys use cell phones to track people in the movies, and I'm definitely a big Jason Bourne fan, you know. So, so tell me, I mean, is that a reality? Oh, yeah, it's definitely more than just Hollywood. It's possible. It's also pretty easy for a bad guy to track you from the signal sent out by your mobile device. I'll bet your Bluetooth phone is set to discoverable right now, and your laptop is probably set to auto-connect to available networks to, on boot up. If you're carrying radio frequency identification tags, uh, we call them RFIDs, you're broadcasting your ID everywhere you go. Got a wireless pay system? In a perfect world, that's pretty cool. In my world, that's like a big target painted on your back. Wow, okay, so you're telling me that if I have something like an easy pass in my car right now, I'm at risk. I'm not sure that I understand how that works. Uh, well, a typical implementation of RFID generally doesn't include security, so there's nothing stopping someone from copying yours standing right next to your vehicle or from a few hundred feet away. Once they've copied it, they can go through tolls, take the subway, enter your workplace as if they were you. They don't even need to make a copy. You can be tracked and identified by your RFID, making it easy to profile your movements or plan and execute a real-life attack. Now, maybe most of us wouldn't be targeted that way, but the point is that as soon as someone decides that you're important enough, devices like EasyPass, key fobs, your passport and the like make it real easy. It makes me feel like you need to find out who's tracking you right at this very moment. Uh, so, so how do we protect ourselves? Well, a good place to start is to protect devices themselves first. For phones and laptops, be sure to practice good computer and internet security, but also password protect them to prevent someone from casually installing something if they have a few minutes alone with the device. Uh, you can also turn off wireless if you're not using it, or at least learn to use the security features if you are. All of them, including RFID, can be placed in shielded bags to prevent them from transmitting when you don't want them to. Besides the device, you can protect the data. Sensitive data should never be stored on portable devices carelessly. If there's no need to carry sensitive information, then don't. 
it only increases the possibility of becoming a target. Otherwise, encrypt your data for storage and during transmission. Great information. Thank you so much for your time today, Mr. Smythe. Words of wisdom for all of us to consider. And now, back to you, Stoney. So there you have it. Bad guys turning good things sour. The same technology that was invented to make our lives better is being used against us. Blackmailed and pillaged by technological advancement. In a perfect world, technology works perfectly. In our world, watch your back. Our time together won't save your cyber keister, but the information I brought you just might. Things have got to change, and it happens one computer at a time, one user at a time. Tonight it seems that our worst enemy is not the clever hackers, but ourselves instead. A secret holiday visit to deploy troops in the Middle East was planned by several U.S. delegates in theater, but ended in disaster when they were ambushed en route and kidnapped early yesterday. An initial investigation found that party's full itinerary, including names, times, and travel routes, was posted to the public internet by mistake several days before the trip. The staffer, allegedly responsible for the slip-up, claims he was instructed to share the trip itinerary with another department and didn't know the page in question was publicly viewable. The government is waiting for demand. One user at a time. Do your part.